Hey guys, what's going on? It's your host Sam Bakhtiar, and this has been so long awaited. I have none other than Patrick but David in the house. Patrick, how are you? I'm good, man. It's good to be on with you. Brother, I've, I've heard of you. I've known of you. I've seen you on your social media. I've followed you, and uh, this has been long awaited, brother. I'm glad to be on, man. I'm glad to be on. And by the way, you got a great story as well. I know off camera we were talking about your background, how, you know, when you came here and some of the stories that we share about Iran that makes no sense to anybody, but it's pretty wild to have similar stories. I knew a little bit about you, but I dug a little bit into your history, you know, and and, and I was like, oh my God, we have so many things in common. We're, we're from the same country. You know, we came to the United States around the same time, you know, and we were both going to be bodybuilders. You know, and it, it's so crazy with some of the similarities, man. But let's talk, go back to the old country. You know, how old were you and when, when you left the old country? Uh, I was 10 years old when we left Iran six weeks after Khomeini died. I think Khomeini died June 3rd, 89. Uh -huh. July 15th, we went to Germany uh, and uh, lived at a refugee camp for a couple of years. And, 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 and what made you, what made you you know, flew from Iran and come, was, was it the war? Do you remember the war? Do you remember getting bombed on? Do you remember the sirens and blackouts at night? At night? A hundred percent. I mean, you know the whole so time I joke, I joke. So I'm glad somebody else can remember that, because when I tell them that, I'm like, I feel like I got a brother now, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I remember, no, no, I remember. No, that whole siren, the siren, the planes would come over the border and they would, you know, the, the red lights and turn off your lights so nobody can see. Yeah. Uh, I remember the first attack when it happened uh, obviously, we had bombing, but when when the when the war got very very strong at some point for like a couple of years, one time they were right above us and it was constantly coming. And my dad finally said, "We got to leave." And you know, the best place to hide is under the stairs. You remember the whole thing where yeah. the safest place to be is under the stairs. Yeah. So yeah. we're under the stairs. The bombs are dropping. You're hearing the whistling sound. My dad says, "We got to go." We went in our white Renault, and in Iran, what were the cars in Iran? Renault. There's two men: Renault and and Paycon, right? The and Renault, yeah. right? And there was a Renault 5. It was, a, it was Renault number 5. I thought it was one. Yes. When I went to France, I saw that there was a billion other Renault, but we just had the Renault 5. And, yeah. and in Iran, if you drove an Alfa Romeo, you were like, you were it if you had an Alfa Romeo. This this, this family's rich. They drive an Alfa Romeo. But we had a Renault. Yeah. It was a two-door two, two, two door, uh, Renault. We got on the car. He said, let's leave. We're headed to Karaj. You remember Karaj yeah, is like a box to L.A. We're headed to Karaj. And then on the way there, we're going over the bridge. And all of a sudden, there's a massive explosion behind us. My dad tells me and my sister not to look back. So we look back. 50 yards, 100 yards behind us, the bomb hit the bridge. Bridge is coming down. We're crossing over the bridge. We go to Karaj. When we go to Karaj, he bombs Karaj. So down. So then from Karaj, we go to Rash. We go to Rash, he bombs Rash. From Rash, we go to Pahlavi. We go to Pahlavi, he bombs Pahlavi. And then I stayed in Pahlavi for 90 days. And you know the whole thing, if you get to an age in Iran as a man, you got to stay because you got to serve the military yeah. there, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. my mom finally had it, and she says, we got to get out of here. And so rather than waiting for the green card to go straight to U.S., we went to Germany, we waited for the green card, and we came. That is so crazy because that was exactly why my mom was like, I think that they were recruiting 12 year olds to go to military, you know, and, and, and I was like, you know, I was around 10, you know, 10 and a half. My mom was like, no, man, I don't want my only son, you know, to, you know, to go to the military and all that. So crazy that you experienced that. I remember every night, bro, you know, you hear the sirens, there was blackout, and there's like, you know, lights and there's, you know, anti air missiles. It looked like, you know, Disneyland, but it wasn't Disneyland, it was actual attacks. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's stuff you see in a movie that, uh, when you explain it, the, the, the average, you know, the, the, the average, point, you can't blame them. It's kind of like, I don't know how much of that is made up, how much of that is Hollywood and how much of it is real. But then when you hear from a few hundred Iranians, then you say, I mean, this must be real that these guys experience. It's funny because, you know, I made it a point years ago not to watch the news, you know, and so I'm ignorant to what's going on in the world. I don't care. I, I know I got to do what I got to do, you know, and one day, you know, I'm in the gym, I'm working out and, you know, somebody comes and say, hey, you know, we're at war. I'm like, we are? We, so you don't know we're at war? I'm like, you don't understand. Where we were at war, you you knew you were at war. You heard, you know, machine guns. You heard sirens. You know, we're at war. You know, I'm like, no, we're at war. You know, that's crazy, you know, how the difference is. And now we're living in the greatest country in the world where they, we're protected. You know, we don't get it bombed on every night.
Yeah, I love what you said. Uh, you, you, you did a video, I think, yesterday yep. or something like that, yep. where you're talking about your love for America. I mean, we are on the same page there, 100% on the same page there. So growing up, you know, what did, what did your dad do? Were you always exposed to entrepreneurship? You know, what did your dad do in Iran for work? My dad made makeup line for Nivea and Max Factor, and he worked in Chadak. So he would leave 5 o'clock in the morning, and he would come back late at night because in Iran, you remember, uh, Iran Sunday is Friday. Yep. So Friday was up, not Sunday. So Fridays you would go to church. You wouldn't go to church on Sundays because people worked on Sundays. And uh, yeah, he he was a makeup guy. He was a chemist. He was a guy that would knew that knew how to make all the lipstick and all the liner, all the uh, masks. That's what he did. He learned how to do that. And so I've never experienced entrepreneurship there. And then when we left Iran. My mother was a stay home. We went to Germany. My dad was in Iran for a couple of years because that's when my parents got a divorce. Then when we came out here, my dad was a cashier at a 99 cent store for you know 15 years. Okay, so and then I joined the army. So I've never witnessed entrepreneurship from somebody doing it. So, so go, go back. So, you, so your mom and dad were together. You know, you know. My you, mom and dad were married for 20 years. They got divorced in 1990 when we were at Germany at a refugee camp. Wow. So, so can you can you talk about that a little bit? You know, because you know, you know, we have another similarity. You know, my mom and dad, you know, got divorced, but they got divorced after three years when I was three years old. You know what I mean? And you know, you know. Oh, in Iran, they got divorced in Iran. Yeah, Iran. And my dad flew to Canada because he had to leave because his last name was Bakhtiar. You know, um, he had to leave. And then after that, you know, I you know, barely ever saw. I never saw him again. You know, I, I talked to him here and there. So you know, so I had, I had that. But your mom and dad got divorced after twenty years, and not even in Iran, in Germany. So tell me, you know, tell me, tell me about that a little bit, if you don't mind. You know, it's it's wild you say that because uh, in in uh, one day I come home. You know, I'm from school. I'm coming home, and uh, I see my mom's in tears. And I look at my sister, I said, what's going on? She says, well, look at the paperwork. I said, what's the paperwork? And my dad filed a divorce. And this is the second divorce they got. Because when they got married, they had my sister. My sister was born. Two years after she was born, they got a divorce. And then the family, you know, the Iranian family was yeah. like, look, this is not something you do. You guys got to figure out a way to make it work. So my dad's like, okay, let's get remarried. So they got remarried. And then they got a divorce 16 years after their second divorce. And this one was final. So once they got a divorce, you know, I, I, I'll tell you this part. We were doing a study. We, we so you were what, nine years old? You were nine years old or eight years old at that time? time? I, in Germany, I'm 11, 10, 11 years okay. old. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming your sister's older than you. Six years. Got five it. years. Okay, ten okay. 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 Yeah. Go, ahead. go ahead. But we're sitting there and we're, we're, we're kind of making a list of all the people that went to a very high level of success in life. And I'm talking about very, very high level of success in life, right? So you look at Elon Musk, you see his father. He had a very big problem with his father, right? You look at Clinton, he had issues with his mom. You know, you, you look at uh, uh, Jordan, problems he had with his family. It's very dark if you study the life, the book they wrote about him. It's a very interesting sister, mom, dad. I didn't know that. Thanks for pointing that out. Because I thought I was fucked up. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting life. You look at Arnold, all of these guys you study, you kind of see there's a time where extreme pain happens. Yeah. And I think when somebody experiences a lot of pain, at the highest level of pain, loss of a loved one, humiliation, embarrassment, death, divorce, heartbreak, it's massive pain. Yeah. It makes your skin so thick to the point where you watch some of these running backs running through the middle and helmets are hitting their forearms and you're thinking to yourself, how did he not break his bone where his skin is thick now? He's not feeling that part. Yeah. So, you know, in, in some ways you sit there and, you know, Iranians, they'll say things like, okay, baby, okay, okay, you know, all this stuff. And you kind of start feeling sorry for yourself. Maybe I am, maybe I am this, I but in reality, it's, it's what you need to go through to make it to the highest level. So it was not easy time, but it made me, I, I can tell you, I don't have a typical experience of a boy from 10 or 14. At 10 years old, I was forced to be 17 years old. If yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That part kind of had me mature faster because I had no other choice. You look at little bullshit in life where people are just like making a big deal out of it. I'm like, what the fuck are you making a big deal out of that bullshit? But you don't understand, man. We got bombed on, got divorced, we lived in refugee camps. You know, I've been through it fucking all, yeah. man. You know what I mean? So, so, 
you know, when you guys came to America, did your mom stay in Germany? Your mom came in America as well. As well. Everybody came here. Everybody so came. My, my, my dad came here first in 84 by himself because his sister was working at the embassy. If you've ever seen the movie Argo, when they when they went into the you know the embassy, my my mom, my dad's sister was working at the embassy. She was married to a U.S. Marine. They came out here to Chicago. My dad came to visit her in '84, uh, uh, and then he came back. And then we uh, left Iran. We went to Germany, but my dad went straight to Chicago in '89 while we were Germany at a refugee camp. And then eventually they're both over here. My mom and dad lived probably 14 miles away from each other. Awesome, man. So, so even though they got divorced, they're still kind of civil now, right? Yes? No? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I think that's not, that, that's not speak, being divorced and civil in a Persian culture. No, I think doesn't coexist. Nothing, nothing civil about the two of them. If two of them get together <laughs> and spend too much time together, a, a man in Germany will be resurrected and start World War III. It just cannot happen. Yeah. And they, they, they are fire when they're together. Like you feel, you, you, know, feel, you, feel, you feel the tension. Yeah. Feel if we had a reality TV show and you know, you know how sometimes you do a <laughs> vlog and you're like, what if I do a vlog and show my life? My life is nothing. If I set my mom and dad here and we set up four cameras and we close the door and we left, that, that, that vlog would get tens of millions of views because they'd be the killing they through, right? all, all over the place here. But yeah, it's, it's very entertaining when you see them together in the same room. Okay. As that, that, I, I love, I love it, man. I, 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 this, is, this is fun. This is fun, man. I'm having, I'm having fun, uh, you know, learning more about your life and especially where we're from the same culture. I can just imagine it, you know. So, so you came straight to, you know, when you came from Germany to America, where did you go? What city? Lived in Granada Hills, California for one month. Mm -hmm. And then from Granada Hills, California, moved to Glendale. And then I lived in Glendale for six months before joining the Army. So... So what made you, all of a sudden, join the Army? Uh, in high school, I had a one point eight GPA. What? I had a one point eight GPA in high school. No, wait a second. I want, I want to hear this correctly. One? One point eight. One point eight. GPA Holy in high school. Shit. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, thought, I, I thought I was hearing wrong, bro. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. no, I had a one point eight GPA in high school. The only thing I was good in was uh, math. Math was uh, fun to me. But anything outside of that, I couldn't pay attention. And I was getting in trouble every once in a while. And one day, my counselor said, why don't you think about military? I had a teacher named Miss Sinclair, health and guidance teacher, who ended up becoming a colonel in the Army. And she would tell me, she says, Pat, you know, military may not be a bad route for you. So recruiting and Jesus Guerra came and met with me at 14 years old. He kind of planted the seed. And the next thing you know, one day... Um, we go out to Dublin's. I'm sure you remember Dublin's if you partied at Dublin's in L.A. Mm -hmm. We go to Dublin's. One night I come home and we're at my sister's apartment till 4 o'clock in the morning. Security shows up. They're about to evict her. I wake up in the morning. They stole uh, my mother's Toyota Corolla 1983. I'm about to go to work at uh, Burger King. And uh, I call the cops in the morning. They found the car in Tijuana. And I called my dad. I said, I need you to drop me off in Glendale to talk to the recruiting station. I went to Jesus Gear. I said, if you can get me to join the Army tomorrow, I'll sign up. I'm not waiting six months. They made a few phone calls. Two weeks later, I was in South Carolina joining the Army. Like, this shit is fucked up. I got to go. I got to get out of myself. I got to get, I gotta get, I gotta get, oh, I gotta get out of here. It's crazy, bro. Crazy. Crazy. Okay, so you joined the Army. You served for four years, I assume. Two and a half years. They had a program called the Delayed entry program at the time, they offered $26,000 of GI Bill for college, and uh, it was for two and a half years. So tell me your military experience, and 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 what did you learn in military, you know, how did it shape you? You know, it's a good question. You, military for me, Sam, was, uh, I, I, I will tell you, it's probably one of the main reasons why we built the company today uh, in 49 states with nearly a half a million uh, square feet of office space. And last month we sold 7,000 insurance policies because we have people that are in Alabama. They live a whole different life. People that are in Chicago, complete different. Miami's different. Uh, right. Fort Lauderdale's different than Tallahassee is different than New York, than Virginia, than, you know, Baltimore, than LA, than San Jose, than Arizona. Everybody's different, right? So when I got into the military, 
in the first week, I got into way too many fights because I was the only Iranian there and they kind of, they, you know, they're not familiar with a nose like this. This is a full on extra large <laughs> nose uh, on growth hormone. I mean, it's a legit little <laughs> nose that I have. And so, you know, I remember one time my sergeant looked at my nose when I was shooting and had the thing over here. And he looks at me and says, what kind of a nose is that? I've never seen a nose like that in my eyes. So listen, this is a legit nose. I said, it'll take 10 grand to make my nose look like yours. I said, all the money in the world cannot make your nose look like mine. I'm very comfortable with who I am. But anyways, I had fun with them. You know, so all of a sudden I got along with people that were from Chicago, New York. I got along with Puerto Ricans. We got along to a lot of fights and more fights. I'm like, we have a lot of similarities. We get along with these guys. And then there was camaraderie. So once there was camaraderie, then it was about learning how to put a team together, learning how to put a unit together, learning how kind of have your own crew, have your own running mates, have your own pride of what we stood for. And uh, I mean, we were working 100 hours a week. 100 hours a week in the military is not a big deal. And you work your tail off. And when you partied, you came home at 6, 7 o'clock and you would get a few hours of sleep. Sunday rest, go back at it again. But it was a lot of hard work and learning how to deal with different personalities. So, so would you say that military really helped you with your business right now because you learn how to deal with different cultures and different personalities and also give you the work ethic. Did you have the work ethics before the military or, 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 or no, you say the military no. gave you the, the work ethic? Yeah. I, 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 ha I always worked. I always worked and I always found a way to make money, always. Uh, so work wasn't uh, given to me by the military because my dad was always a worker. I mean, you know, you know, Iran, when you're coming up, I mean, you're, you're from Alaska and Bakhtiar, you know, Iranians know how to work. It's not a, a, a lazy community. We're workers. So I had that part. But what the military did teach me is work at a whole different level. Like if I was working 60 hours, military taught me that you can get close to 100 hours a week for periods of time and really create momentum. And I'm learning how to get along with different personalities. You know, you're not going to get along with everybody. But if you're on a team, and you're going on a mission, sometimes the guy you hate the most may end up being the best guy to run with because he's going to complete his mission. And sometimes the guy you like the most is going to be the least most effective in war. So it's not about yeah. who you like and who you don't like. It's about who's going to get the job right. done because the mission's yeah. bigger than the individual egos. And, and that kind of taught me to realize that when you're running a company, you're not going to get along with everybody all the time. There's going to be a lot of people on your team that annoy the hell out of you, but they get the job done. So how do you do that? How do you work with that? And uh, that, that's probably one of the elements I learned in the military. Wow, that, 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 that's profound. So, you, you know, you're military two and a half years, you know, you get out, what happens? I get out, um, I'm a Hummer mechanic, so I come to LA and there's a, there's a, there's a store dealership that was selling Hummers at, uh, not Camarillo, I think it's like Thousand Oaks or something, something like that on the other side on the 101 freeway. <laughs> Now, when I said, I'd like to be a Hummer mechanic, I know the job pays thirteen fifty. They said, we already have two. We don't need anybody else. So I said, okay. My sister was working at Valley Total Fitness. And I went and started working at Valley Total Fitness. She got me a job there. And I wanted, you know, this, I wanted to be a bodybuilder. I wanted to be the next, you know, Arnold, Mr. Olympia, Hollywood, the whole nine. And, uh, you know, right at that time, I met a girl named Jean Bier, who was a uh, uh, advisor at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. And when I met her at the, uh, Venice Beach, she comes up to me. We start dating. She would always pick me up in a different car. I said, how do you make your money? She said, I'm an advisor at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter for a lot of the Laker players. I said, how do I become one? Long story short, after a lot of the conversations we had together, I got into the business the day before 9-11, and then my financial industry gets started there. So you got a business before, a day before 9-11, and then day August 9-11 happens. I mean... I, I can't. I can't think of a worse time you can get in business, bro. Like, like, you know, like, you know, you know. say that, Sam. Our guy Dave Kirby, who was the branch manager, sits us down the next day, the new broker, <laughs> and he flat out says, "Guys, I'm telling you, you may want to consider working somewhere else." Oh, he says because it's going to be the toughest next five years in this business. It's not going to be easy, but he said. 10 years from now, it's going to be a great time to be a part of it because these baby boomers are retiring. If you can be around for 10 years, good for you. But I suggest you go to a different business because he had, he had been in the business for like 35 years. And he was kind of advising us to, it's going to get very ugly because I'd be, he'd been around through a couple drop-offs. And you know what? A lot of guys left. I decided to kind of stick around and ended up kind of working in my favor because it minimized competition and only those that could survive got all the business. Mm -hmm.
So, so you worked for Morgan Stanley for, for how many years? And, I, I, and how old are you at this time? 21. I'm, I'm 21, 22 years old at the time. So I Morgan Stanley for, for a couple of years? One year. One I worked year. at Morgan Stanley for one year. I got my Series 7, 66, 31, 26 life and health. So I could sell stocks, bonds, mutual funds, money under management, you know, futures, commodities. Uh, that was a specialty. And then I left and went to Transamerica. I was there for seven and a half years. And then PHP got started October 20 to 09, which our 10 year anniversary is here coming up in the next few weeks. And so when you left, I, I know, I know like the, 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 I, I'm not very savvy like you are in the financial world. I know like the big players are Prime America, you know, Transamerica, you know, World Financial Group, Transamerica and um, PHP. Right, right now, those, those are the prominent top three big dogs in there. So when you left that, you know, did you, were you thinking between maybe Prime America and, and Transamerica? What, 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 what were when you I left Morgan thinking? Stanley? Yes. When I left Morgan, what a great question. Sam, I'm going to give you an answer that probably very few people have heard this answer. So I'm at Morgan Stanley, Dean, where 9-11 happens. We're about to go to World Trade Center for the three-week training. They send us to San Francisco. So I go to San Fran. We stay at the Mark Hopkins Hotel and everybody got a buddy, meaning you roomed up with somebody. They didn't give you a room by yourself. You had a room, a roommate because you stayed with them for three weeks. The guy I roomed up with, I remember his name till today, his name is Ed Malikto. If he sees this, he's gonna crack up. And he had a CLK 430 at the time. And you know, so for us at the time, CLK, CLK 430 was a badass car back in the day. It was a badass <laughs> car at that time, yeah. So, Everybody would see that CLK 430, you know, man, this guy's got a CLK 430. And we roomed up. I said, so why are you working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter? He says, you know what, Pat? I uh, used to be at a company called Primerica. I said, oh, you left Primerica to go to Morgan Stanley Dean Witter? He says, yes. I said, I've never heard of Primerica. Tell me about it. And he says, well, Primerica is a, 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 a good-sized company, but their main focus is more recruiting agents and developing them than it is about building strong advisors. I said, interesting. I said, so is there any money in this recruiting thing that they're doing? He says, oh yeah, there's people making millions, but it's just not for me. I wanted to be an advisor. So for three weeks, I'm asking him questions about what they do there. And obviously, eventually, Primerica met a lot of great guys there, but it wasn't a fit for me because they mainly focused on buy-term investor difference. And when you're on Morgan Stanley, you kind of learn that you need to have a little bit more options about selling products. But they are still a very yeah. big company out there. They got to respect. They got a great CEO today that's getting the job done. And I respect any CEO that gets the job done. Long story short, it comes to the last meeting at Morgan Stanley where they bring the guy, almost like the boiler room scene with Ben Affleck says, this is my wife, this is my car. You know the scene I'm talking about, right? And the speaker gets up, good looking white boy. He says, I drive a Ferrari. I go to all the Super Bowls. I go to Masters. I have this. You can tell the guy, like, you know, just proper, look like the guy. This is my wife. This is my house. I said, guys, we got to take this guy to the bar tonight and see if we can get some real answers out of this guy. So we we'll take a couple drinks. <laughs> yes, because we need to know how we did it. So we go to the bar and uh, I said, listen, man, so. You know, what is the deal? How are you making three million a year and all these other guys are stuck making six, seven, eight hundred thousand all year in? What's your deal with making three million? And he said, Look, you gotta learn how to produce. Very important. But you built your three million dollar net income by recruiting and building a strong team of advisors, and that's what I do. I said, So what does it take to be you? He says, Well, I went to UCLA and I have my bachelor's and I have my MBS, and I'm not doing that. <laughs> I do <I> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, not, I'm just not doing that. I said, I said, then I said, let me ask you, is there like a tier of who they promote first, ethnicity and all this stuff? I'll never forget. He says, yes, Caucasians first, then it's Asians, then it's African Americans and Latinos together, then it's everybody else, it's others. Yeah, I, said, you're so last, last, bro. I said, where would I be? He says, you're in the other section, is what he says. <laughs> and I said, you know what? At least you're being honest with me. So I stuck around. I like the, I like this uh, uh, transparency. And uh, he was just a chill guy, a guy that you would have gone along with, just a regular guy that uh, was a performer and a killer. And so at that moment, I kind of knew, you know, if I stay there, I got to go to school route. I don't have the patience to wait 10 more years to get an MBA. I want to go build a business. So I had a choice between Primerica and Trans, and this presented itself. I went and uh, joined the Trans for seven and a half years. Got it. Okay, so tell me your time at Trans. I mean, obviously, you were there for seven and a half years, and me knowing you, your your work ethics, how hungry you are 
You know, you joined Transamerica, how old were you? I was 20, I'll give you exact. So April 15th of 2002 is tax day, is when I got involved there. And then I left and resigned September 23rd, 2009 is when I resigned. So between what age and what age were you there? I was there from 23 to 30 years old. So you, you put in seven hard years, and me knowing you a little bit that I know about, so you were probably crushing it, right? You were, you, 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 you were just, you know, you know, you put in the work, you know, you, you know, were you crushing it? So for the first year, I didn't trust anybody. I didn't trust anybody to work with anybody. So for the first year, I was kind of like on the side, uh, on the sidelines, and kind of watching everybody. Who and then a year late, my who, dad. Who recruited you? Say that again. Who recruited you for for um... a girl named Jamie? A girl named Jamie that we worked at uh, Bally's together. Gotcha. But Jamie recruited my sister. My sister recruited me. So gotcha. you know the whole family thing. Gotcha. Kind of how I got recruited. But anyways, I got into it, and I'd say first year was a, a little bit of an in out. I was in a relationship, and my dad had a heart attack. And then when my dad had the heart attack, I said, okay, let me see what I'm going to do now. And then I got into the game, fully committed, and then started really teeing it up. Probably 2005. And then 06, 07, 08, 09, we're just breaking records and kicking major ass and competing with the best guys for the last four years. Okay. So this whole time, you know, you, 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 know, you started kicking ass. Once you committed yourself after, you know, after the first year, you, know, you started kicking ass, right? And, um, and you talk about relationship in this time, you know what I mean? So I want to I slow down a little bit because as an entrepreneur, man, you know, no, me knowing you, and, and us, we are the same bloodline. Entrepreneurs just go, 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 go. You know, and obviously we still want a relationship, but it's hard to have a relationship with someone who understands our life, you know, our mindset and all that kind of stuff. You know, you coming up in the world, you, you're trying to make a name for yourself. Was that a hard thing for you to do? Having a relationship, having a woman who understood and stood by you, that, hey man, I gotta work, I gotta hustle, I gotta, I gotta you know, I gotta do that. Was that was, was that ever a problem with that? Because I know a lot of entrepreneurs have issues with that, including myself back in the day. That's a good question, man, because I was just coming out of the phase of where I was done playing around. You know, I was done having the four girlfriends and, you know, hey, you're in the car. Another girl picks up. You don't recognize the number you pick up on speaker. She wants to talk. <laughs> it's just too much. And and. And, and for me, there was a part of it that was funny at the time because it's like, hey, look at this, you yeah. know, she's yeah. upset. Look at the text she read. And it's like, hey, brother, I know that's part yeah. of the game. You know, you know, we kind of yeah. uh, brag about it a little bit. Then one day my dad has the heart attack and I'm at UCLA at the hospital. And I got to tell you, man, you know, I'm, I'm writing this book right now. We're about to uh, 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 get it finalized. Every day Simon & Schuster is hounding us to get this thing to him. But there's a line in the book where it says, that's the day I, the old Pat died. Like I killed the old Pat that day because when I'm sitting outside of the hospital and I'm upstairs and I see my dad is having his heart attack about to die. And, you know, they kicked me out of the hospital because I made a scene. They said, you can't be over here. You cannot be complaining. This is a government hospital. You're not paying for this. Taxpayers are paying for this. You can't make any demands. I went downstairs in the car in my Ford Focus and... I, uh, uh, I'm sitting there crying like a little baby and I said, I gotta make some changes. So I, I said, everything in my life, I have to know if the people around me are 100% in because I'm all in. Yeah. I said, I'm going, I'm doing financial industry for 20 years. So my 20 years started in 2001 and I'm going 20 years, which means 2001 to 2021, I'm in. Whatever it takes, I'm all in to do this 20 year run. And so I went to my girl at the time, dropped that gorgeous girl. She runs a very, uh, a, a well-known uh, PR company right now in LA. She dresses Beyonce. She dresses everybody. We're still friends till today. My wife and her and are also fr uh, a friends because when I met her first, we went on a double date and my wife went with her ex and I went with her. So we were good friends at the time. Anyways, you know, I went up to her. I said, look, I think it's time that we see if this relationship is real or not. She said, what do you mean? I said, I want to see if we can go 30 days without having sex. And she said, I'm you sorry. Said that? <laughs> I said, I want to see if we can go 30 days without having sex. She says, you're serious. She said, yes. She said, have you met somebody else? I said, no, I haven't. She says, Pat, what are you talking about? It's like every day times two, three, four. That's not going to be possible. I said, let's try it. I want to see, see what we're going to talk about if we don't have sex. 
So she says, okay. So I had an expedition, which was roomy. I'm a six, four guy. So the back seat was very easy. And, uh, she said, let's do it. So we go next day. We're going to movies. We come back from the movies. We're in the car. It's late at night. So what do you want to do? So I don't know. What do you want to do? So we're outside of our house, the typical parking spot, which is like by a tree. And you know, they're like yeah. right <laughs> angle where the steam's going to cover things up. And it's like, uh, what do you want to do? I said, I got to drop you off. So I drop her off. She says, you're serious. I said, yes. Then the next time and the next time and the next time, a month later, we're like, look, you know, I just don't know if there's going to be anything here. So eventually after fight, you know, all this other stuff, she just like, you, you, you know, found out, you found out that the only thing you really had in common was sex. So it was like, it wasn't the right relationship. Let me put it to you this way. She's the biggest sweetheart in the world. But she wanted to go Hollywood. I wanted to go business and finance. Yeah, yeah. So I was holding her back. She was holding me yeah. back. And it was not fair to either person. Yeah. Yeah. So we just kind of amicably said, her family, I love her family till today. She loves <laughs> us. My dad and her are great. But we went our separate ways. And I did that with everybody. Peers, friends, family, girls, everybody. And it was very like filter. I'm trying to figure out if, if who are the real main core people in my life that I can run with for the next 20 years. I want to find running mates that we share common values, principles, vision, simple. Who is it? So, so that was the entire mission for my game at the time. Once I found it, it was like, okay, cool. No, great. It's all good. No force. You don't want to all good. You do. Let's go. Boom. You can hang while you're tough. Okay. This is going to be great. And then it was a run. Now, and doing that, you know, doing that, you know, our, our culture is kind of crazy, you know, kind of, kind of, we're different, you know, doing that. Does your family and your relative, sometimes think that you, you know, that Patrick is just a weird guy in our family. You know, he, you know, he, he, he's, he's lost it. You know, he does his own thing. He's not a typical Persian guy, you know, and all that. Because at a time, like, me being a bodybuilder, you know, me being an entrepreneur, me not going to every family, family function, or not, me not eating horish, you know, horish every time they have that because I was bodybuilding. I mean, first time I shaved my arms, I was a bodybuilder. My mom cried for a week, you know. Um, so, you know, you being who you are, was that a time where they're like, my family's like, well, he's just a whole different breed. He's not, he's just different. Yeah. And, and, and the best part about it was I finally understood who I was and I was okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, 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 I've gone through a lot of fights and arguments with different people in my life. Sam, I've never fought anybody or argued with anybody the way I argued with myself. Never. The worst arguments for me are right here. Yeah. There's the worst arguments. Yeah. Okay. And I wanted to get peace here. This is where I wanted peace because the only one person you and I have to spend the rest of our lives with yeah. is this person. Yeah. Yeah. Not my wife, not my kids, not my mom, not my dad, not my sister, not my peers, not my investors, nobody. It's just you. So once this thing gets cleared, then all these other relationships get better, but it's not the other way around. I had to get clear. So I sat there and I said, look, I read two books. One of the book is called uh, First Rate Madness. And the other book is called Hypomanic Edge. Two books, Hypomanic Edge and First Rate Madness. And it talks about the level of manic or insanity, like to the edge of craziness that it's required to get to the next level of winning. And so many times today, they'll call you a certain thing. You know, you have ADHD, you have this, you have- You're obsessed. You're obsessed, whatever they want to call it. For me, it was like, I'm glad this is my wiring. I'm very comfortable being this. So it was no longer trying to sell to family, to peers, to people. This is who I am. You don't like it? It's all good. But I know what I'm going to be doing next. And that was the part. And the vision got that. clear. Once the vision got clear, it was just about finding out if the people that were there in my life at the time also wanted to run. If they did, great. If they're not, I supported whatever they did. But I got to go do what I want to do. Yeah, I'm going to order those books as soon as you know this is over and, and, and order on Amazon. Really quick, so so this is now going to be the hard part, you know, and, and I'm going to, you know, I, w- I want to dig deep into the psyche of what you're thinking, right? So you're working for Transamerica, right? And you're working for Transamerica, you know, you're doing good. At one point, something clicked and said, I can do this better myself. You know, you know, you know, it's, it's like it happens, to, it happens to us all the time as an entrepreneur. You know, you, 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 you go to a business, you see how they're doing it. And you say, well, yeah. they're doing that okay, but I can do this better, right? Yeah. You know, so, 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 you know, they're doing a lot of things good, but there's other things that I can change and tweak and, and, and get better. So when did that happen? When, when did you get that light bulb and say, you know what? 
this is cool, but I could definitely do, do a better job than, 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 than there. That's a great question. So just so you know, I never had any plans of starting my own company at all. And I'll tell you why. Here's why. It's not a better life. I, I, I don't know if this makes sense. It's a better life to build a book of business and you make three to five million dollars a year not having to deal with attorneys, lawsuits, yes, I, I, I hear you, bro. I hear you. I you know, hear you. operations, technology, CRM, because my life today, like yesterday, was my son's birthday. He turned six years old. I was at Yontville, Napa Valley, spending two days with National Life Group, and I'm there it's kind of seeing what the issues are going on with insurance. And on his birthday, wake up, Jim, come back, conference call, then cake, six candles, come on, buddy. And then, you know, we go eat at, you know, we're right across from French Laundry, which is a four-star Michelin, you know. So we're going to all these other places. But my wife says, babe, you realize you were on the phone six hours straight. Like, it wasn't like six hours with a pause, six hours straight. My phone died two times. So I have, ha you know, you know how you got to carry these big battery packs yeah. that's got like double, double yeah. charges. Like I, got those. I got those. You know which ones yeah. I'm talking about. So I, when I was over there, here's the only thing that happened with me. A woman named Susan, she knows who she is if she watches this. A woman named Susan was given a little too much power. And she was the former assistant of the uh, former CEO and founder who left. And this woman, Susan, was uh, 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 very interesting on the way she handled things. And on a couple occasions, she mistreated me in a promotion and all this other stuff. And I kind of started calling around saying, let me ask you a question. Did my own digging. I called everybody that I've been there for a while. I said, who is she? Tell me how much authority she has. And they said, what do you mean? I said, is this a person that will ever get fired? Oh, no. Oh, oh, no way. They will never fire her because she has so much, uh, what do you call it? Uh, there's a word for it. She has so much, uh, not social capital, but see, she has a lot of a, 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 a data history of the company. They're just not going to let this woman go. I said, okay, so then it's me or her, right? I said, now I got to figure out what's going on. Then at the time, what I did, look, I mean, these were my best friends. These are guys I travel to, and I'm the guy that when you go on a trip with me, I'm the active one. I'm the one that wants to go climb the mountain. I want to go swim with whale sharks. I'm the guy. I'm not the guy that stays at the spa, gets my nails done. And, you know, I'm not that guy. I want to go out and kind of see the city place. where. So I build a lot of friends. You know, a lot of these guys were on my wedding. They had a lot of good relationships together. But Susan made me question the future of the company. So I read a book called Barbarians to Bureaucrats. And it talks about how at first when a company gets started or, or society gets started, there's a profit. The profit is the visionary. Okay. Here's what we're going to do with the company. The profit casts a vision. Then he attracts builders and explorers. A builder may be also the profit, but a builder may be somebody else. So here's what I think we can do. One day we can go out there and do this. And one day we can do this. And one day we can make Amazon this. And one day we can make Apple this. And so the visionary casts profit. Then a builder shows up. I can help you build this vision into reality. Then explorers show up. I can go explore different markets and see what else we can do. Then administrators show up. We need to make sure we're good with all the paperwork and data. Then bureaucrats and aristocrats show up. This is when it's kind of like this. Yeah. I'm above you because I control the law. So it's kind of like, you know, you got a person that goes to make billions and becomes an entrepreneur. You got another person that says, I'm going to get power in a different way. I'm going to go into politics and I'm going to control your laws and regulations. She was her. Yeah. And I identified it. I said, you know what? She ain't changing. She's been like this for a long time and everybody else is validating that's like this. So you have to walk on eggshells working with her. I had no desire to walk on eggshells working with an employee like that. And I knew the value she had to the company. So she, it was either me or her. Then I went and uh, did my rounds. I met with a lot of the names. You know, I met with all of them, every single one of them face to face. I said, what's your game plan? One of the guys I met with, you know, he remembers this conversation. We sat down and I said, look, what's your next game plan? What do you want to do? Do you want to build this business? Because I don't know if you want to build this business. I kind of feel like you're wanting to be a personality more than you want to build this business. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's you. What do you want to do? Then I went to another guy who was a guy that mentored him and spoke to him. I said, so what's your frustration? And he was frustrated with the company. She said, he said, look, I'm in the same place you are. I'm not happy with it. But he's making $4 million a year. You know, he's at a place that he's given 30 years of his career to the company. So I came back and I said, I got to figure things out. 
So I went and called my board. I had all my advisors at the time that I respect. And I said, guys, we got to have a meeting. I need your opinion. I need your advice. And I flew them out with me to events. I literally said, let's go to an event. What for? I want you to talk to some of these guys and tell me the feeling you're getting. I want to tee it up. If I want to tee it up, I want to know what the vision is the next 20 years. So we did. And we came back. And I sat down. And I drew it out. And I'm, you know, the board. How about if I do this? How about if I do that? And one day, September 23rd, I woke up 3 o'clock in the morning. This was not planned. And I said, I'm resigning today. Told my wife. Three months after we got married, I said, we're resigning today. She says, today? <laughs> I said, I just have a gut feeling today's the day. She says, babe, we just had a great month. I said, I'm resigning today. She calls my dad. My dad calls me. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Patrick, you just married this woman. What are you doing? You have a good life. Why are you doing this? I said, I got to resign today. You're not going to sell your code number? Nope. You're not going to sell your clients the thousands that you have? No. You're going to leave all of this behind? Absolutely. I-, I cannot live like this. We left Iran to come here because I want to be free. I'm not going to walk on eggshells. And if that's what Susan wants to do, and that's what some of the other guys that are there, good guys, they're going a different direction. I said, let's go and compete. So we started a company exactly four weeks later, October 29th, on a page lawsuit like this comes in from Agon. They sue seven of us. So I have to go to court. I get to, I get an attorney. I have to represent everybody. And they sued us. And I said, look, I'm not going to take the clients. We're not going to do anything. But uh, let's try to settle. And then we settled. And then nine months later when we settled, I've only been sued one time in my life. That was a time. We left. We don't have client complaints. We got, you know, 100,000 plus clients. Uh, and we don't have client. Last month alone, we sold 7,000 policies in a month. So, you know? so, so, so you're like, you know what? Different you know, direction. I, you were like, I want to walk on eggshells. I don't want somebody else to to uh, control my future and my trajectory. You know, I'm willing to give everything up to start fresh. I'm going to do my own thing. You know, you just, it, it's not like you went and, and called the old clients and trying to give you, you just did your own thing and went, went, went and do your own thing. So tell me why PHP? You know, how'd you come, how'd you come up with the name? So, so, so the idea with PHP came about throughout that six-month process of uh, uh, seeing what I wanted to do next. It was kind of like, let, let me see what I'm going to do. Let me see if I'm going to go this route. Because I flew out to Atlanta once, and I had a meeting with all their attorneys, the president, everybody's in the room. So I'm at the boardroom. This is the office of the former CEO, and I'm sitting around the boardroom with all their attorneys. And I said, I got four decisions I'm going to make today. They said, what is it? I said, one, I'm sticking around for 20 years and I'm going to be one of the biggest players, if not the biggest player here. Two, I'm going to sell my business. Three, I'm leaving the industry. Or four, I'm going to go start my own thing and, you know, see if I can make it in the business. But I'm going to make one of those. And I was transparent about it. And I'll never forget one of the guys had a smirk on his face. (laughs) Good guy. He had a smirk on his face. He wasn't one of the main players, but he used to be a player back in the days. He probably at the time is making, I don't know, shy of a million dollars. And he smirks. And he says, sounds like the approach people typically take where they start off with a threat because they want a bonus or they want money or they want something to be given to them. And I said, you know what? I sat there and I said, I don't blame you for thinking that because if the last 15 people did that, I mean, if you're right 15 for 15, you're probably going to be right 16 for 16 times. And by the way, this guy... Sweetheart of a guy. Good guy. Had a kid. I would always play with his kid when we'd go to Hawaii. But he says, Pat, everybody does this. No one believes you. You know, they don't think you're going to leave. Why would you leave? You're having the businesses growing. You're on your track. Why would you ever leave and do anything else? I said, well, you know, I don't blame you, but I'm not playing around. I'm really actually wanting to tell you this is my position. After that meeting, six months later, I left the company. And I went and decided to do our own thing. And, our, you know, our focus was a different focus. Back at that time, nobody was doing social media. Back at that time, I saw a, a uh, one-term senator become a two-term president, Barack Obama. Back at that time, we saw Ron Paul, a 69-year-old man, raise $6 million on MySpace in 24 hours. And I said, we're going to go compete in the marketplace and see what we do. If we don't make it, I'm totally fine. If we do make it. So one thing that I've noticed, I'm, I'm looking at, at everything from an outside world. You know what I mean? You know, I don't... You know, um, you know, like, like I told you before, you know, I have a lot of friends in Prime America, 
you know, Trans America, you know, and now I have you, you know, in what you do. I don't know a lot of your agents yet, you know, but, uh, but I know a lot about what you do. But one thing I've noticed from, from the outside, from a 30,000 foot view, you know, is that you are freaking killing it on social media. Like, I mean, killing it. You are, you, if, if I have to come up, come up with a word, you are out marketing everyone on social media with value attainment. You know, I think you had a, you had a, a, a life of an entrepreneur video that, you know, you know, you kickstarted it, you know, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff where from, from what, what I have talked to my friends in, in, in the, in the, um, in the financial industry, you know, and, and a lot of times I'm like, Hey man, why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? Because I'm all about social media, you know, I'm going to mock with my gems and they're like, no, we can't do that because there's this regulation and this regulation. And I have to, you know, run it by the, the company company and I have they're to They're telling this. you the truth. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and then I see you that, and you, you, you do, you do everything that, that, that they, they said that, well, they can't do it. They have to run it by the company. You know, yeah. how, what's the difference? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're regulated. I, you know, you're regulated by that. But, but, you know. I, I tell you, I tell you about a conversation one time I had with Ed. Ed called me, and I said, uh, "Listen, man, what are you what are you waiting for?" He says, "What do you mean?" I said, "You're one of the top five best speakers I met in my life. I mean, it's like when you speak, the room has to listen to you. You got to start creating content." And I knew way before he was going to create content. If he got on, he's going to blow up. He's going to do good, right? For me, I wanted to go to a complete different route because today, you know, again, it goes back to the same thing with me is I, uh, I don't like to be controlled. I don't like the games. I have certain non-negotiables. If you cross my non-negotiables, it's your way of saying life is better without PBD than with PBD in my life. I don't force you to change your negotiables. Like I'm not the guy that's going to convince you to be with me if you're a girl. I'm the guy that you're dying to be with me because my proposition is this guy is a killer. I am. I can't wait to be with him. Yeah. Right. That's my play. So if I'm coming out and I'm and I'm creating a proposition for you and I and I don't like to be controlled. I don't like to be manipulated. I don't like you telling me something in my face and then behind closed doors, your defamation yeah. of character at the highest level. When you do that, yeah. you automatically permanently you lose this guy. Yeah. You know, social media is a very. Uh, uh, interesting space. Yeah. It's just as competitive as anything else. There's a lot of guys that we'll talk to about behind closed doors. Well, you know, I kind of don't like the fact that he does this and that. And it, it's kind of like clickish. And I'm not in any click. You don't see me in a click. I don't want to be a click. I get invited to a lot of these places to speak. I do five speaking engagements per year. And that's it. I don't do more than five. I'm not trying to be uh, this uh, this motivational. It's not it's not my uh, cup of tea because long-term vision, what I want to do, that's not the play. But I don't have any hate for the people that want to take that route. But I saw what uh, Trump did. I saw what, uh, you know, Obama did. I saw what a lot of these guys were doing today. And today is not an easy time to, it's a very easy time to exploit somebody if the other person is not creating content. Yeah. Like, for instance, if I don't have any content online, you don't know who Patrick Ray David is. Nope. The only thing you would think of me is based on what all your peers yeah. in, in that area told you who Patrick, and you have to believe it. Because that's the only thing you know. But if you want to know who Patrick Bay David is, you go watch a couple hours of content. You're going to say, you know what? I just kind of like this guy. I trust this guy. I can't see how he can rub people the wrong way. But he's very comfortable in his own skin on what he believes in. And he's willing to talk about some stuff that probably pissed some people off. That's probably why some don't like him. But you know what? I kind of know who he is. I'm good. So you make your own position. If somebody wants to know who Sam is, like you message and Pat, when are we going to figure out a way to do something like this? So I said, let me go look him up. I think the first time I heard about you was through Presadio. I think you and Albert were, uh, did something to you. Yeah, I spoke at his event. I spoke at his first event. Yeah, and he, he, he had a lot of good things to say. Albert, man, he's a, he's a real dude, man. I love that guy. Yeah, yeah. He says, you know, he says Albert's a good guy. So, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in the world to know a lot of that. And then you send a message, and I looked at some of your content. I said, you know what? I, you know, th this is a guy that came from Iran. Look what he's doing. Good for him. More power to him. I bet he's probably an inspiration to a lot of the younger guys, Iranian, that are also wanting to become bodybuilders. Look at the lifestyle. He seems like... A confident guy, but doesn't come across as cocky. You know, how is he not cocky? He can be a little bit cocky. Muscle guys are cocky. And I'm sure maybe 
you know, that's part of maturity and all this stuff that we both go through. I was a very cocky guy. I'm still a little bit, but it's probably more confident than cocky. I say, you know what? I like this guy. But if I didn't have access to your social media, how am I going to know who Sam Bakhtiar is? 100%. Now I have that idea. So, you, so our resume today, the reason why I encourage anybody, including my competitors, to create content is because let the audience decide who you are. Yeah. They are not naive. The audience is going to vote the same way they vote for president is the same way they're going to vote for people's concepts and transparency. I like this guy. You know, he's my kind of guy. Let me follow this guy. So, you know, that would be my answer to you. And it's one of the reasons why we stopped selling securities, which is, you know, Series 6, 63, Series You know, I'm licensed till today and we have a broker dealer because it's the securities that doesn't allow you to create content. Oh, it's not a life so, insurance. So securities, you know... Part of my ignorance, what is securities exactly? What like like is that stocks and bonds and stuff like that? You got it. Is that what it is? Best, best way to put it. Best way to put it. Anything that has the chance of going up and down is a security. Because there's a risk of loss. Mm -hmm. So the next time you think about securities, you can buy a mutual fund, it can do 22%, but next you could do minus 38%. Got it. Got it. So insurance is just you buy insurance and maybe they have some separate cash value where you're making some money interest, you know, zero to 12% or 11%, and that's making, but you're never going to lose 40% on an insurance policy, especially if it's a universal index, universal lot policy. Securities, because of that, FINRA came in and they wanted to over-regulate everybody. So that means I got to talk to you, I got to go this, I got to do that, and that, that, uh, that kind of prevents now. a lot of these guys to promoting themselves. That sense. That, that, that could, my, my big question was why Patrick can do it and why you know some other competitors cannot do it is because you don't sell securities no more, you know you know you know so so so, so you, you you don't you know you know you, you stop selling securities because sec securities is very highly regulated and and part of me if I'm wrong is probably more headache to deal with, you know than than insurance no. Yeah, and and, and a big part of it is also uh, uh, anticipating what's going to happen next. So Trump is the president today. If you look at election, this is how it goes. You got uh, uh, Jimmy Carter was president. Prior to him was Gerald Ford, you know, and then prior to that was, you know, say prior to Nixon was Kennedy. So if you go Kennedy, Ford, Republican, you know, uh, Carter, Democrat, uh, Reagan, Republican, Bush, Republican, Clinton, Democrat, Bush, Republican, Obama, Democrat, Trump, uh, Republican. The next person that's probably going to get elected is somebody like Elizabeth Warren. And if an Elizabeth Warren gets elected, the first thing she wants to do is over-regulate the financial industry. And the first industry that's going to take a big hit is securities industry. She's going to over-regulate the hell out of it. And you got to be prepared from now because if your basic structure of your business exactly. is built on that, like when she went after Primerica CEO and president, you just got to go on YouTube and type in Elizabeth Warren, Primerica president. Look what she does to him. You know, this video got 40 million nearly views all across social media, Facebook, and she's just going after for no reason. So if she does that, securities may not be the best place in a recruiting business. When did you decide not, 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 not to do securities? Was it, was it recently or, you know, when, when, when was it? So, so I read a book called Blue Ocean Strategy. I don't know if you've read yep, the book, I'm Blue right. Ocean Strategy. Yep. Great so book. you know, the book. Yep. I mean, I... Yep. I'm always promoting this guy. People think I probably am friends with this guy. I've never met the guy. It's a great book. Everybody's got to read it. Um, and he talked about the whole minimize, increase, eliminate, create, right? So for me, one of the things we decided to minimize and eventually eliminate was broker-dealer. But it was gradual. So originally it was minimize, and then years later was eliminate. And the eliminate has probably happened in the last two to four years. It's not a, you know, uh, uh, it was a, mentally getting everybody to realize this is just the direction we're going to be going in and we made the well, decision. It seems, like, it, it seems like you, you know, you, you, you know, Pareto's principle, right? You know, you know, you say, Hey man, 20% yeah. of things that I do give me 80% results. And those 80%, you get rid of the stuff that not really give me results and gives you all the headaches, which, which makes total sense. You know, and, and, and you being in charge of your company and not having the bureaucracy of, you know, answering to a bunch of other people and doing all that kind of stuff, you can now make quicker moves rather than, Absolutely. you know, you can make Absolutely. quicker moves. And I, I always say, look, the reason Titanic sank because it was so big, it saw the iceberg and couldn't maneuver fast enough. Yep. You know, and, 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 and that's you know, so true. The, the biggest, I'm business. sorry, go ahead. And that's so true with businesses. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, no, what I was going to tell you is that's the whole thing about barbarians to bureaucrats. You, you read this book by Lawrence Miller, Barbarians to Bureaucrats, explains exactly what you're talking about. Because once the bureaucrats and aristocrats are in charge, a fall is around the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right now, man, you are absolutely killing it. You know, you know whether you like it or not, you know, you are, you are a motivational speaker. You know, I, I get forwarded your stuff, whether you're doing it intentionally or not. I know you're not doing it intentionally. It's not part of your thing, but you are, man. I mean, you know, I get your stuff forwarded all the time and, you know, see your stuff. And, you know, you, know, you, you have helped so many people live the American dream. You have helped so many families and secured them for the future. You know, you said that, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be in this game for 20 years. So you have so 2021. Is that still the case or, or, yes. or, or is that still the case? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's still it's still the case. Now, that doesn't mean I won't be the chairman of the board and involved, but going 80 hour work week for 20 years was my commitment to the industry. I, I was going to get into this game, make my positive impact and leave. And maybe one day a group is going to say, I want to follow Patrick's footprint on what he did. And then I'm going to write the book. This is the blueprint on what happened on what I did. But my 20 years will be up 2021. So if you know any CEOs, I'm hiring. I respect that. And I respect somebody who you know sticks to their work. Cause I told myself I was going to retire a year ago, and now I extended it five more years. I have four more years oh, to, go, by, to go. By the way, don't don't mistake that with retirement. I, I, I there is this guy is never retired. Oh, yeah, 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 a, yeah, yeah, You know, I definitely don't. Yeah. No, 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 there there is only you. one person that's going to retire this guy, and, and the it's the man of right? The man of Ain't nobody retiring this guy. <laughs> if he gives me eighty years. You better believe every day this guy's going to get up to want to compete in the marketplace, whatever he's doing. Yeah. If he gives me a deal. If he tells me, Pat, you got to come up here to play backgammon with some of my, uh, you know, profits and people up here. Or maybe you got to come up to heaven and see if we can even qualify you to get into heaven. I'm ready for it. But if he gives me eight years, I'm competing every day. I don't think anyone's ever going to see me retire. I recently watched some of your videos. I think your last event you had, it was a few couple of months ago or something like that, wasn't it? That, was it George Bush there? You know yeah, so we had we had Jordan Peterson there. I think that's the last live interview Jordan Peterson did because his wife was going through cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a Billy Bean there. We had Kobe Bryant there. Interview with Kobe Bryant. I got that forwarded about a billion times. Like, like I got you know that 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 interview that you did with Kobe was just so good. Yeah, I appreciate that, Kobe. And then we did President Bush, and that was surreal because he walked up on stage, and you're like. A president, and he doesn't do private events. Like if people call him and they say, hey, you want to do private events, Bush is not at a point where he needs another $200,000 or $300,000. Yeah. I don't, even, I don't even know. I don't even know how you pull that. That would be a separate conversation offline. Yeah. You know, but, but when I saw that, I'm like, what? I've never seen a president of the United States come and speak, you know, at a private event. So that, that, was, that just, you know, obviously tells a lot about you about what you have done and, and, and the respect that people have for you. It, I appreciate that. It was a two and a half, hour, two and a half year background check. So <laughs> it was cool. An, so an, an Iranian, an Iranian, yeah. an, 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 an Middle Eastern Iranian from a terrorist country had George Bush speak at his private event. You know, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. You know, I, when you put the two and three together, like Jesus Christ, crazy. Yeah, it was, it was a good moment. Yeah. Well, brother, you know, it's been an honor. It's been a privilege to interview you and to get to know you more at a deeper level. Like I said, this has been long awaited for me. You know, everyone was like, you know, Patrick, man, I think that's from the same country. And, and now that I've got to know you, all the similarities, all the, all the things that we've gone through. So for the people, for some reason that they haven't heard about you and what you do, what is the best way for them to find out about what you do, get to know more about you and, 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 and to connect with you. Yeah, so so the best thing to do, if you want to see content, you can go on uh, uh, YouTube and just type in Valuetainment or Patrick Bed David, and you'll see me everywhere. But if you want to text me, you can text us directly. At I, I, you, wait a second, stop. Yes. I, I saw that yesterday. I'm, I'm, going, oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm driving back from LA. You know, I'm, yes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I don't drive no more. I have somebody drive me now because I, I, I hate fucking wasting time. I'm, I'm in my Sprinter. You know, with my team, we're going to like, text me. You know, I'm like, this, this that can't be your not text number. And you're like, if you don't believe me, try it. Tell me yeah, about so that. <laughs> and they got videos back and they got pictures back. Like, wait a minute. Really? I said, 
Jonathan and I give him their last name. This is PBD. This and I move around. I'm like, this is not a bot or anything. This is me. But yeah, I mean, if people want to stay in contact, it's 310-340-1132, 310-340-1132. We got a vault conference that'll come up 2020, somewhere mid-year of 2020. We'll do a three-day conference to get I do one of those per year. And if everyone, anybody wants to find out more about it, they can send us a text and we'll put them on the waiting list. That is amazing, man. I'm gonna I wanna be on the waiting list, man. I wanna be there. You know, Patrick, I, I, appreciate, you Patrick, I appreciate you, man. I, you know, and, and thank you so much for being on the show. It's been, it, it's like I say, it's been a privilege and an honor to have you. Thank you so much. And if anything comes up that we need to know, make sure you reach out to us. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me, bud. I thank really you. enjoyed it. Thank you. God bless. Thanks. Take care.